Today I want to talk to you about heroes. Because if the world needs any time in history, heroes it is today. Father, I pray that you will take my mind and my spirit and anoint it to your Holy Spirit tonight. I do not ask for the joy of preaching a great message, but I have a great truth. And I pray, God, that you'll make it alive. Let people be touched for the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Nietzsche was an atheist who hated God and hated Christians and hated religion. He believed that Christianity produced slithering wimps. He said, you people are not willing to be strong. He said, you worship weakness, make strength out of gutlessness. And he would rage on and on. He said, it injures people, takes from them the want to be gallant. And in the course of one of his tirades, he said to one of his dialogue partners, I cancel thee. Cast not away the hero that is in your soul. Now, when I look into the mirror and I look around me, reflect on what's going on in the world today, but what's going on in my heart also, I'm convinced that we need to take the challenge of this atheist seriously. Cast not away the hero that is in your soul. Now, when I speak of gallantry, it means more than bravery. Linguistically, gallantry has to do with a daredevilishness. It has to do with an optimism, a, a cheerfulness. Now, brave can be so, sober and even somber. But gallantry, it has an element of somebody that will fight anything over anything or eat anything. So when I speak about gallantry, that's what I mean. Today we're in desperate need of individual gallantry. But also we need a community of believers or a church that is gallant to the core. Now gallantry means different things to each one of us. It may mean a David Livingston. Outstanding young doctor with a bright future. All England admired him when he shocked England by saying, I'm going to Africa to take the gospel. Years passed. 20 years later, somebody raised the inquiry. Where's Livingston? Have you heard from him? Is he dead or is he alive? The inquiry became so great that Stanley, the famous newspaper man, decided that he would take a convoy with him and they would search for the David Livingston. They went up and down the jungles, down the rivers. A year later, they found him with the village of natives that was suffering disease that was killing them, an epidemic. Livingston himself was old and gray-haired, suffering with the same virus and fever within his body. They said, we came to take you home. There'll be a hero's welcome when you return. A prayed, living in your country wants to honor you. He said, I'll give you my answer tomorrow morning. He prayed that night. And the next morning he said, no, God has called me to here. And I'm going to spend the last days of my life with people that I love. They bid him good bay. And they knelt upon his knees that day and prayed, oh God, before another year passes, I pray that you'll take me on to heaven. And almost a year to the day, they found Livingston on his knees. He had died while praying. The news went back to England. They came with the army to collect his body, take him back to his homeland to have a funeral that would be like for a king. But the natives said, you cannot take him. He belongs to us. But they said, no, he, he's from England. He's English. But the natives said, no, he's us. His heart is here. It looked like there would be a standoff. They raised their spears. The army raised their guns. When a very wise native took a dagger, 
walked over to the Bible, the body of Livingston, thrust his knife in his chest, ripped it open, pulled his heart out, cut it free, held up and said, you may take his body, but you will not take his heart. Today, if you walk into Westminster Abbey, where kings are buried and queens lie in a state, as you walk through the door, you have to walk over the grave of David Livingston. His body is in England, but his heart is in Africa. When I think of bravery and galaxy, when I think of heroes, I think of David Livingston, or I think of Mother Teresa, outstanding young teacher, but as a young girl, God called her to go to India, and she gave her life to reaching people who were dying with leprosy. And yet in her biography, she writes, all the work that she did for God, she never once felt the presence of God in her life. She felt even that God had forsaken her. And yet how many people can serve God and live for him when they don't feel like it or feel his presence? What a hero she was. And of course, when I think of gallantry, I think of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, knowing how it would end. He placed his face in the direction of death to the cross where he would lay down his life for you and me, willing to leave his Father in glory to come and be the sacrifice that would save this world. But if we're to be the people and the followers of Jesus that we were called to be, there must be a willingness to face life with steady eyes, gallantly taking whatsoever should come our way. Now, we know that we're all built differently, aren't we? Some come out of the womb afraid, sucking their thumb, covering their head. Others come out with a cigar in their mouth and their fists clenched. Others come out with smiles on their faces and roses in their arms. Yes, the Bible said we are fearfully and we're wonderfully made. There's only one of you. There'll never be another made like you. There's a way that you worship God. Nobody else can worship God. There's a way that you love God, and he'll receive that love from no other one like you would give. And if you are not all that God wants you to be, something will be missing out upon this earth. But in the end, we all know the difference between cowardice, gluttonousness, and cheerful bravery when we see it. When we see this virtue in other people, what a great feeling it is and now and then we get a, a slight glimpse of it in our own self. And it really feels good. I was just a boy in junior high school. There was a big fight on the playgrounds. Don Ross was the meanest guy in the school. He loved to fight. He looked forward to fighting. One day, there was a big fight. We all heard about it during the day. And that night, you know how junior high school kids do. They gathered in a big group. And Don Ross went after this man. He smashed his nose. I mean, brutally was beating this guy up. This man was just barely surviving. It was really a tragic thing to watch when suddenly my dad, who came to pick me up, started across the field. Five foot eight, 230 pounds. He walked to this fight, and made his way through the crowd, broke up the fight. And Don Ross said, get on way, May, mister, or somebody's going to get hurt. And he said, my dad said, the somebody may be you. The spirit of Steve Smotherland came on my dad. Amen. <laughs> and with blood splattered all over my dad's shirt, as he broke the fight up, I saw gallantry. I was so proud of my dad. It was a wonderful, wonderful feeling. 
I was invited several years ago to peak, preach at the Pentecostal World Conference held in Sydney, Australia. I preached in that city many, many times. Called the, I preached the General Assembly there. I had a real group of friends who loved me dearly. Many times I preached in their church, and they applauded, and they cheered, and they amen me. But speaking to pastors from all over the world that day, God laid a message on my heart that I knew would not be popular. I knew it may not be well received. But the Holy Spirit said, I want you to preach it. When I finished, there was no applause. There were no amens during the sermon. When I finished, there was no pat on the back or attaboy, pastor, or nothing whatsoever. And as my driver drove me back to the hotel, there was only silence. But that night when I laid my head on the pillow, I knew that I had pleased God. And you see, the doing of right has built within it its own reward. Let me repeat that again. I said the doing of right has built within it its own reward. You don't need to have somebody to say that was good or you're wonderful or you're great. And how many times that you did something, maybe that was unpopular, but it was right. And there was a great feeling in your heart. Oh, we all want to be gallant. We all want to be brave. We all want to do what's right because it's always right to do right. I repeat it again. It's always right to be right, to do right because life is a field of honor. And we've been called by Jesus Christ to live in that fashion. And now, the Church of Jesus Christ has a history of gallantry. Nietzsche could not have been right when he said, Christianity always produces wimps. F.W. Fuhrer, the most elegant preacher that ever preached in the 19th century, tells us that when the mobs were waiting in the amphitheaters, for the fights to begin with the Christians. Bored stiff, they begin to yell, the Christians to the lions, the Christians to the lions. And the officials would go looking for Christians to feed to the lions. Fewer says that in that day, even the weakest little boy in his quivering voice would stand up and identify himself and say, I I'm a Christian. That's our heritage. Tom Paine probably was the most famous of all of the atheists that ever lived. He would travel the nation giving his famous anti-anti-God atheist lecture. He would end this discourse by saying, I'm going to prove to all of you that there is no God. Gather around. Listen closely. And he would shake his fist to the heavens, clench his teeth and say, if there is a God, I want you to strike me dead in one minute. Gather around, let's see if there's a God. God, and he would curse and say, strike me dead. 45 seconds, he'd say, God, maybe you're asleep. Did you hear me? Strike me dead. We're gonna see if there is a God. 30 seconds. Five, four, three. And when it hit one, he would scream. See, there is no God. See, you've been misled. When suddenly, at the back of the building, a little lass, a little girl stood up. And she began to sing. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. She probably didn't sing it that good, but she did sing it. <laughs> Hurts me when you laugh that way. When Sunday a man stood up with her, now it's a duet. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. 
And then two more stood up, and there was a quartet from victory on to, and then a choir stood up, and then the congregation stood up, and they ended by saying, we must not suffer loss. And somebody said, what happened to Tom Paine? And another said, well, he went out the back door when the little girl stood up for Jesus. Come on, can you say a good amen? I don't know about you, but as the world becomes more wicked, I'm going to become more violent. Come on, say a good amen. Stand up for Jesus like never stood it before. That's why I love this church. That's why I love your pastor. He's a bad man. How many of you know it? Amen. We need people, two-fisted men of God, that'll stand up and fight old smutty face. Come on, say a good amen. And stand for what is right. Case in point, some time ago, I was watching Jesse Ventura. How many of you know who Jesse Venter is? Raise your hand. A lot of sinners out here. Amen. (laughs) And he was screaming against Christians, saying they're a bunch of weaklings. Religion and slaves makes you passive. You might have saw that broadcast. How that long, you know, rings and curls and you know who Jesse Venter is. He's that overblown steroid, fake wrestler. Amen. (laughs) Your spirit's now coming on me, brother. Amen. Thank God. (laughs) And I had enough of it. So I sat down and wrote him a letter. Dear Mr. Ventura, I was watching what you said. Christians are wimp. Now I'm 60 years old and you're about 40 years of age. So we're going to see who's the wimp. I challenge you, and you all know how I just run and walk from Phoenix to L.A., 436 miles to raise money for the dreams just so I knew I could do it. I said, I challenge you, you're a young man, I'm an old guy, to a race from Minnesota all the way to Los Angeles. Now, if you do not accept, you are the wimp. And I said, I probably will never accept it. You won't. You won't write me back because you are a coward. And by the way, I was a prophet. He never wrote back. Now, I know that's a wild illustration, but I'm just tired of people dragging the name of Jesus and the church and God's people through the mud. They're the best people, not perfect, but they're the best in the world. Come on, give the Lord a good clappy for that right now. My point is, our heritage is one of gallantry. Now I want to read you the most unusual scripture. I doubt if anybody in this building ever recognizes scripture. It's Proverbs 3 and verse 25. It says, be not afraid of sudden fear. And then it goes on to say, happy is a man that feareth all, fears always. It might surprise you, but today you are listening to a coward. That's right. I'm a coward. I get afraid. I'm going to tell you some things that I'm afraid of. Want to hear? First of all, I'm afraid of that beautiful woman that I live with. Amen. (laughs) By the way, it's my wife. I better straighten that out real quick. Amen. And all the men said a good. See, you're afraid. That's what you are. You're afraid to say. Someone said, Pastor Barnett, are you afraid of death? No, no. (laughs) I wish there were some other way to get to heaven, but dying. Someone said, Pastor, do you want to go to heaven? I said, yes, but I don't want to be on the next load to get there. Amen. (laughs) No, I don't fear death, but I'll tell you what I do fear. I have a secret fear of having a stroke. You see, I love life. To think of being incapacitated, would be very hard for me. Yeah, I'm a coward. i tell you something else I'm afraid of. I'm afraid of battles, but that's really not true. I'm not afraid of the battle. I'm afraid of the battle before the battle. Let me explain that. Now, once I get into the battle, I kind of enjoy it. 
But when I see the storm clouds rising and a storm is going to break, I see the battle lines growing and I know there's going to be a fight. I dread it. But once I get in the battle, I kind of enjoy it because I expect to win. You know, we may play ping pong and you may beat me two out of three, but we're going to play three out of four. Amen. And if you beat me three out of four, we're going four out of five. And we'll be there all night until I win. Come on, say a good amen. A little guy walked up to me too long ago. After him, he preached. He said, Pastor, I kind of gather that you're a bad loser. And I said, I don't know. I never lost. Amen. (laughs) Now, that's not completely right. But I hope that we raise a generation of Christians. You know, we raise our kids different. We raise them to say, go ahead and play football. But if you lose, that's okay. So Johnny's team lose 60 some odd of nothing. And on the way home, we buy him a Dairy Queen and say, honey, you're not a very good basketball player. But you're a good loser, son. You're just a good loser. We sent him off to fight a battle in Vietnam that we lost not because of firepower, but because of willpower. And if we don't watch it, we'll raise up a group of people in the church that expect to lose. Look, when you walk in this building, there is a spirit here that these people think they're going to win. Come on, say a good amen out there. There is a winning spirit in this church. We are the head and we're not the tail. I wish somebody would shout a big amen. Thank God. Let me tell you something else I'm afraid. Not so much of the fear of God. Oh, I do fear God. But I'll tell you why I fear Him. I fear losing the goodness of God. I would live in such a way that I do not lose His goodness. God has been to me. To live without God would be awful because pastor said it. Everything we are is because of the grace of God. I fear to lose the goodness of God. And yet every great accomplishment that has ever been done has been done by people who were cowards, people who were afraid. So if you are afraid tonight, don't feel badly about it. There's nothing wrong with fear. Follow me closely because here's the message. There is something wrong with fearing fear. You see, there's nothing wrong with being afraid unless you're afraid of being afraid. Unless you're afraid to enter into some endeavor that God has called you to do and you're afraid in that endeavor. God is simply saying here, don't miss this, that we should choose to be afraid because in choosing to be afraid, We are overcomers. The only fear that God tells us not to have. I am not to be afraid to be afraid. God is saying we're to choose to attempt things that cause us fear in our life. Things that are so big that we would fail if God was not with us. In other words, we should not shrink from being afraid because it takes courage to be afraid. In fact, progress is made in one's life when that person decides to be afraid. The first sermon I preached, I was scared to death. The first church I went to, I had 76 of the meanest Christians you'd ever seen in your life in that church. I was scared. When I was overseas, I had a demonic man to stand up a witch doctor and come after me on the platform. It scared me to death. We decided to start the Dream Center. I thought maybe we're going to fail. What will our church say when I make the announcement that this is what God has called me to do? When I announced I was going to run from Phoenix to L.A., 430 some odd miles, and use it to raise money for the Dream Center, I was afraid I couldn't even do it. But I decided not to be afraid of being afraid. Oh yes, I'm a coward. 
But as I look over 82 years of my life, I've lived my life in fear, but I've chosen to live in fear. I chose to have the courage to be afraid. You might encourage you all to know that every good accomplishment that has ever happened in the annals of world history have been made by cowards all the way from William Wright to Christopher Columbus. All of these accomplishments were made by cowards, but they were not afraid of being cowards. Happy is him who feareth always. So for the next five minutes and then we're done. You'll say, Pastor, I, I struggle this fear thing myself. How can I overcome it? Let me give you three things real quick. Number one, you got to face your fear. Fear's a big bully that'll bully you if you can. I used to dream as a little boy that somebody was chasing me, a monster was chasing me in the night. Have you ever felt that way and you couldn't get away? You'd run, but you just felt like you weren't getting anywhere. And you'd eat out and crawl trying to get away. And one night I was screaming out as I woke and my mother ran and said what was wrong. And I told her what I'd experienced. And she said, son, next time that monster comes after you, stop, turn around and face him. And the next night I had that dream that I had often. I turned around and faced that monster, picked up a baseball bat and beat the devil out of him. Amen. <laughs> you know, he never came back. And the only way to defeat fear is face it. I've been scared all of my life at any new endeavor. And number two, how do you overcome fear? When I face overwhelming challenges in my life, God speaks to many people different ways. Some people he shows visions. Some people they hear the voice of God. I've never experienced any of those, and I'm not against that. I believe God speaks to people that way, but the way he speaks to me is he raises a possibility. He shows me a path that I can go down, and I see the possibilities, and I ask this question. I say, what if? What if that could be God? I'm really not sure if it's God or not, but I'll never know. Until I go down that path and God opened another path and another path, there are miracles waiting for all of you. There are possibilities that you come in contact with life, but you don't have the courage. That fear factor keeps you from experiencing the possibilities that God just might be in it. There's a story about that in the Bible. Matthew chapter 9, share us. He cleans the temple. He's a godly man. He has a tough decision to make. His daughter, who's 12 years of age, is at the point of death. He's got a tough decision to make. He says, Jesus is coming, and if I stay right here, my daughter could die. But if I go where Jesus is, she might live. Follow me. What faith guarantees is this. I don't know whether God's going to bless me in this endeavor or not. I don't even know if God's going to show up. But if I stay where I'm at, it's for sure I'm going to die. So if I never kick my faith in, I'll never know whether God was in it. And I'll never know really if God would show up or not. But it's for sure if I stay here, I'm going to die. In 2 Kings 7, there's even a more realistic story of four lepers at the gate. They're starving. They're dying. They say, if we stay here, we're going to die. If we go back to Jerusalem, we're going to die. But what if? Everybody say, what if? if. Come on, say it loud. What if? what if we go to the enemy's camp? Here's how faith works. I don't know. We might live. We might die. But if we stay here, We're going to starve to death. We're going to die. But what if? 
And the Bible said these two lepers decided to get up at twilight and go on. And as they were moving, moving to the enemy's camp, they heard chariots and battles. And as they were moving, God caused the enemy to run. The very moment that their faith kicked in, so did God's grace and mercy. Miracles happen in the enemy camp when we move and show up and just raise the possibilities and say, what if? The first church I pastored, I didn't know if it, how it was going to turn out, but I said, what if I go to Davenport, Iowa? And we took a little church of 76. Eight years later, 4,000 people were coming. 47 buses, thousands of children. One day I said, Johnny Cash, who we had a part in reaching him in Nashville. But I asked him, I said, I said I, I'm going to ask Johnny Cash, what if I ask him to come to Davenport and we'll rent the stadium and we'll have the great crusade and we'll have the greatest Sunday school attendance in history of any church in America. I raised the possibility and I went to Mr. Cash, and he came. He brought his entire entourage. Over 30,000 people showed up that day. And when I gave the invitation, while Johnny Cash sang, come home, come home, it's supper time, 3,000 people rushed to the front of the, excuse me, 6,000 people rushed to the altars and were gloriously saved by the power of God. <laughs> Possibilities. They are everywhere. There's one more thing that will overcome fear. I believe that everybody will have in their life a moment in time that they have an opportunity to do something that could change the course of the world. That's what we saw happen a few weeks ago when the fellow was killed. We're having change in the world today. That might have been that man such a time as this. It was such a time as this that God has done great things. God put somebody at a certain place at a certain time. It could be that you encouraged somebody that went out and did something great for God. But I believe we will all be faced at one time with an opportunity to do something that could change the course of the world. And the question I want to ask you here tonight is, do you want the power and the strength to face fear in the face? Do you want to be that person that lets that hero, by the way, there's a hero in everybody's soul if you just let it come out. Some of you will never experience that because if you check out the great inventions that have occurred in history, almost without exception, they were men who believed in God, who had faith in God. And I believe there are people that God brought to this service tonight. There are people watching online right now. You don't know how you got there, but something just brought you and kept you there. This is your such a time as this. I believe there are people in this building that God brought. And if you don't make a decision to give your life to Christ, He'll bring out the hero that is in your soul. If you don't make it tonight, you may never make it. Because oftentimes, judgment comes after an unheeded warning. For some of you, this is the night. It's either now or never. The Holy Spirit is in this place. It's almost like I can feel the rush of the angels' wings as they hover over this service right now. So while every head is bowed and every eye is closed in this building, some of you sit there and say, I've listened to an old 82-year-old man who even now seems to have so much future in his heart. And yet I'm young, I'm healthy. I've got a mind that's sharp as keen as a lawyer. The alarm goes off in the morning. 
but I have no reason to get up. There's no reason to live. There is a hero in your soul that God would like to raise up and give you a purpose, a desire to live. And I know I'm talking to people that have lost the desire. I'm talking to people that in recent days are just a heavy cloud that you fell day and night with all the distress we see in our nation. But God brought you here to give you a hope and a future. So before I pray, I'm going to ask everyone in the building to raise your hand and say, Pastor, I want to thank you for your message. I need God. I need Him now. I need Him bad. Pastor, there's got to be a better life than what I'm experiencing. Pastor, will you just pray for me? I really need God. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm going to count to three to give you time to raise your hand. And I want you to be a man of courage gallantly put your hand up and I'm going to pray for you right from this mic nobody will know who I'm praying for except you and I and God heads are bowed I believe God's ready to move when I come to three let me see you raise your hand one every head bowed every eye closed two when I see three from the left to the right to the front to the rear of this building husband, wife, boy, girl people watching this I want you to put your hand up and say, Pastor, will you pray for me? Let me see your hand all over this building. Come on, put them up right now. Oh, this is beautiful. Oh, they're going up all over this building. This is beautiful. Keep raising them. Pastor, I need God. I want to be what God wants me to be. I, I can't do it without God. I need God. Pray for me, preacher. Come on, keep raising them. There's got to be 50 more that need to raise your hand. Put them up high. This is your night. This is your such a time as in. Don't miss it. And now I'm going to go a step further for the Bible said. We must be willing to confess before men what God has done in our heart. So I'm going to ask every single one of you, and I believe it's going to be a hundred percent. If you mean business, if you're not ashamed of God, if you're going to let fear keep you in your seat, you sit there. But if you're not ashamed of the one who wasn't ashamed to die on the cross for you, I want every one of you that raised your hand to stand to your feet, and I'm going to pray for you all over this building. I believe it's going to be a hundred percent. Get up now, all over this building. Oh, get up all over this building. Oh, come on, somebody shout. Somebody shout, come on, give the Lord. Remain standing right now. Now, re remain standing. I'm going to ask every one of you to take a, another step, a step of faith. I want to pray for you. I want to be right here close to you to lay my hand on you. I'm going to ask every single one of you that are standing here, like they ask in a Billy Graham crusade, I want you to step out. I believe it's going to be 100%. Come to the front of this building, and we're going to pray a prayer of repentance together. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, come on, give the Lord a shout right now. Come on, give the Lord a big shout. Why don't you turn to the one that you brought and say, come on, I'll go with you. Ask him. Do you need prayer? If you do, I'll go with you. Oh, church, you ought to be dancing in the aisles right now. Heaven is shouting. Heaven is rejoicing. Come on, make some noise. Come on, give some praise to God. Beautiful. Look at this. Keep coming. Just keep coming. They're pouring out of these aisles. Take courage right now. Get over your fear. Turn to the one beside you and say, look, I'd be glad to go with you to the altar. Come on. If you need to go for any reason, I'll go with you. That's it. Do it. This is beautiful. Oh, they're still coming. Still coming. Let's wait just a minute. This is why we have church. Amen. Now, while they still come, I never 
get used to this. I never do. The Bible said that if we will confess our sins, that he will forgive us. It didn't say if we prayed loud. It didn't say if we got goosebumps. But it said the moment that we call upon God and repent of our sins, that Christ comes in and forgives us. So I'm going to ask you to repeat this simple prayer with me. It's called the prayer of repentance. And if you'll repeat this from the depths of your heart and mean it, Christ is going to come to your heart right now. And I want you out there that know Christ in the audience, I want you to join with them loud to encourage them. I want us to make the heavens ring because it was for this moment Jesus died. Together loud and strong, everybody repeat with me. Dear God, I have sinned. And I need a Savior. You said that if I would ask you, that you would forgive me. And I believe you, Lord. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose from the grave. And I believe that you're going to forgive me of my sins. Because you said you would. Today I accept you as my Savior. And I'm going to raise my hands right now. Just raise them up right now. And I'm going to say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Make it ring. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If you're struggling with obedience, well, why does God want me to do that? And that just doesn't seem right. It just seems like, you know, that's just, he's asking too much. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of us will give you a delight in obeying the Lord. How many want that delight in obeying God? We're like David. David.